Okay. This is class 40. We only get to 41. It's today and Friday, and then, you know, we kind of part ways until the final exam. Um, so in class on Friday, we're going to do kind of a hands-on activity with HECRAS. So please install that on your laptop and bring your computer to class so that we can work through that together. I am a real novice when it comes to HECRAS, but I know there's a couple of experts in here, so if we get in trouble, maybe we can lean on them. Uh, homework three, I sent you an email yesterday about that, and I've also uh, I attached the new version of homework 13 to the email I sent you, and I also swapped that out for um, on Blackboard. Um, basically, I changed the slope of it so that it would force the solution to be a mild slope and subcritical flow. It just made the problem a little bit easier that way. And I also threw in the, uh, the answers to some of the steps there, just so you can be assured that you're on the right track. So homework 13 is still due before class on Friday. I want you to be done thinking about that assignment so you can focus on that HECRAS activity. And then we'll have our final exam on Tuesday of next week. We've got 120 minutes, and so it's going to be longer than the other tests that we've had. Um, but I'm thinking to scale the number of problems linearly with the amount of time. So, you know, if you've finished early in the past, I think you're going to still finish early on the final exam. Um, I'll provide the same formula sheet that I've been giving you through the whole semester, and I may also, in addition to that, throw in some of the other formulas. For example, you know, uh, table 10.1, which has the geometric shapes. Um, I wouldn't expect you to have anything on that memorized. But what you do need to know is how to apply some of the methods. On the back side of that formula sheet, I summarize like the uh, standard step method and direct step method. And so um, when you're solving something on Excel with a spreadsheet, you have to start from a blank workbook. And so you're not allowed to use your previous homework assignments. You can't use the template files that I've provided. So for any question I ask you to use Excel to solve, you're going to have to know the process well enough to create your own approach on Excel. So uh, that's the information I like to give you about the final exam. Does anybody have questions? No? Okay. We're going to do a couple of examples related to sewers today. And where we left off on Monday was just uh, talking about how water flows through sewers by gravity. And uh, that's just so much cheaper if you don't have to pump water from place to place. And also it makes sense because ordinarily they'll have the treatment plant next to the river and the river's the lowest point in town. And so there's an opportunity there for all of the water to flow downhill towards the point at where it's treated. Uh, let me show you this video just because it's kind of fun. It's kind of funny. Um, it's not the best video quality because it was taken a long time ago and at night. But nonetheless, the main idea is that because pipes don't often flow under pressure, usually it's gravity flow, that means that the water's not going to be to the top of the pipe. It's partly full. And it's, you know, we talked about temporal distribution, that people are putting water into the sewer very little at night a lot in the evening though. So it goes through those daily diurnal cycles where there's a lot sometimes and very little sometimes. So most of the time, the depth of the water here indicated by H is less than the diameter of the pipe. And so there's all these geometric formulas here that allow us to figure out, for example, what's the depth of water in the pipe if we know the angle in radians. Uh, that the water level makes with the center of the pipe. And by the way, when we're using these formulas, you have to make sure your calculator is in radians mode. I think probably by default, most of the time we keep our calculator in um, degrees mode. But for these, you need to switch it to radians. And we'll work an example today, and so be sure to do that. Switch it over to the modes there. Manning's equation, when we substitute in these expressions of area and wetted perimeter and so on, um, we can rearrange. This is the simplest that Manning's equation gets. And this is in the SI version. 
where we haven't put 1.49 in like we do if we're working in traditional units. So um, it's complicated because of the geometry. And what makes things more complicated is the fact that the end value that we'd normally just assume is a constant actually changes based on how deep the water is. Because as the depth is really low, we have a relatively large wetted perimeter relative to the area. And uh, so there's a nonlinear change between wetted perimeter and area. And the effect of um, friction from the pipe, which we kind of capture that effect with the end value, it's not a linear relationship with depth. So these figures have been developed. I just showed you this very quickly on Monday, but let's take some time now to look at it more clearly. These figures have been developed to take into account the relationship between wetted perimeter and area and how that affects the flow rate as a function of partly full flow depth. So if, if you're able to calculate what would the capacity of a pipe be if it was full to the top, then you can use this figure to find out if you know the depth of the water, y, relative to the diameter of the pipe, then you can go over to the side here and you can see what is the ratio of the flow rate at that depth to the full flow rate. So like if a pipe was half full, so if y to yd was 0.5, then what you'd do is you'd go over and intersect this curve and then down. And what that looks like to me is about 42%. So 0.42 is the ratio of q to q full. 0.42 equals q to q full. So it's easy to calculate q full you know, because the area and wetted perimeter, we don't have to worry about all of that angle and radians nonsense if we just assume that the pipe is full. So it's easy to calculate Q full. And so then you'd find out the Q at some depth, Q uh, at 50% depth would be 0 0.42 times Q full. So that's how you can use this nomograph. It's got the calculations built into it graphically. And so it's kind of a way of sidestepping the need to calculate the, uh, the angle of the pipe and the area as a function of that angle and radians and so on. So that's one way to do it, is to use the nomograph. And you can see it's got the ratio of the flow rate to Q full as well as the velocity ratio. Now the other approach besides using the Q to Q full um, figure is to go ahead and you do calculate what is the angle and radians and then you use that to calculate what's the wetted perimeter and the area and so on. But you still have to use the nomograph in that case because then you have to use a modified n value. So like if we had it 50% full you'd go here and intersect this curve and go up. So what this shows is that, see, this is 1.2, this is 1.3, so it looks like 1.24. If it's 50% full, so at 50% full, then the N to N full is 1.24. So what that means is that the N value, the roughness, is 1.24 times what the end value would be if the pipe was full. Does anybody know what's a typical end value for a concrete pipe? Does that stick in your mind? Because it's something that's come up a few times this semester. 0 .013. 0 0.013, classical end value for concrete pipe. What this is saying is, is if it's only half full, that the end value for a half full concrete pipe is actually higher than if it was all the way full. So 0.013, uh, let me just do this on my calculator, 0.013 times 1.24 is 0 0.01612. So if it's only halfway full, what that means is that there's more resistance to flow if it's only halfway full compared to if it was all the way full. And that's because you've got relatively more wetted perimeter to the area than you've got if it's all the way full. 
So it's kind of an interesting thing, and we're going to work through an example problem both ways. One using the flow rate ratio, and then one, we're going to calculate the angle and the end value ratio. This is a really important formula. This is how we calculate the angle as a function of the flow depth and the pipe diameter. And uh, this is an inverse trigonometric function. Uh, the inverse cosine sometimes is also called arc cosine. And on my calculator, it's labeled as ACOS. So this formula is saying COS minus 1. And that does not mean, this is really confusing. I, I looked it up on Wikipedia this morning because I was just wondering, like, what's the history of that notation? And uh, calling it COS to the minus 1 was uh, started in like the early 1800s by a guy. Um, and and the, the thing that makes it confusing is you'd think, well, I take the cosine and then whatever the cosine is to the negative 1 power. And that's actually not true. M cosine to the minus 1 is part of the name. It's not, uh, the minus 1 is not a mathematical function. It's part of the name. So um, maybe I should just throw that all together and just express it in terms of uh, ACOS. ACOS is the function that you'd find in Excel as well as possibly your calculator. Does anybody have the Casio calculator? Do you see on the Casio calculator, is there a uh, arc cosine button? Does it show it as cosine to the negative 1? OK, so they're using that old 1800s notation. Doesn't surprise me on a Casio. <laughs> but anyways, we'll work through it both ways today. So here's the example. We've got a 24-inch diameter pipe which when the pipe is full, the end value that applies is 0.013. Water's flowing at a depth of 9 inches, and it's laid out on a slope of 0.5%. So what we want to do is find out what is the Q full, and then we want to find out what is the flow rate when it's only partly full. So we want to see, like, what's the capacity of this pipe that's partly full? And this will be our first exposure to this partly full hydraulics. And this is something that is important for the FE exam. I've written a few questions that uh, are directly related to this uh, partly flowing full pipe. So Q full, we're going to use uh, this problem is in traditional units. And so Manning's equation is 1.49 area to the 5 thirds, slope to the 1 half, n times wetted perimeter to the 2 thirds. Okay, so what we know here is that the n value which applies since it's full in this first method we're applying is 0 0.013. Uh, the flow depth is 9 inches which is 0 0.75 feet and then the diameter here 24 inches is 2 feet. Okay, so let's substitute this into Manning's equation. We have to calculate the area, for example. So we know the area of a circle is pi d squared divided by 4. So that's uh, pi 2 feet squared divided by 4. So we want to find out what would be the q full. We're going to find out what's Q full, and then we're going to use this figure. Oops, we're going to use this figure to find out the ratio of Q to Q full. So uh, the area is 3.14159 feet squared. So pi feet squared. Uh, wetted perimeter for a circular pipe is pi d. So pi 2 feet, that's uh, 6.283 feet. So let's put that into Manning's equation. 1.49, the area is 3.14159 feet squared. And that's to the 5 thirds power. The slope, the problem says, is 0.5%. So 0 0.005 to the 1 half power. I'm going to ask you to solve this, by the way, so you can get your calculator out and warm it up. The end value in the denominator and the wetted perimeter, 6.283 feet, and that's to the 2 thirds power. So the question is, what would be the pipe's capacity 
if it was all the way full. Let me pause for a second, allow you to put that in your calculator and tell me what's the full flow rate. the screen just to illustrate so we're getting it worked into the so recording all right okay 16.04 cubic feet per second is what the capacity of the pipe would be if it was all the way to the top. But it's not. What percent full is it right now? Um, right now it's 9 24ths full. So 9 24ths is 0.375. And let's go to the figure and see if we can find 0.375 on the figure. Back in the old days, we used to be able to write on the screen because the, uh, the projector went onto a whiteboard. Now I have to restrain myself not to draw on that. Um, so nine, uh, 0.3, so here's the ratio of depth to uh, diameter. So here's 0.3 and here's 0.4. So 0.375, so we need to go 3 quarters of the way between 0.3 and 0.4 to get 0.375. So that would be, here's half, here's 3 quarters. And now over, intersect, down to this point, and uh, I read that as 0 0.24. 0 0.24 is what I've, uh, 0.375 to here and down. So I'm going to say that um, from the figure, the uh, Q to Q full, is 0 0.24 and so thus Q is 0 0.24 times the 16.04 cubic feet per second so that works out to be 3.85 cubic feet per second So what that nomograph took into account is both the, uh, the end value effect and then also the, uh, the reduced area and wetted perimeter that arises when it's not all the way full. So it's accounting for three effects simultaneously in that nomograph. But I think it's important for us to also use the angle method so that you know how to do that. So for the angle method, we're going to find theta, the area, and the wetted perimeter based on these formulas that are at the top of the screen. And then once we know theta, then, well, theta is the first thing we'll find. That allows us to get the area and the wetted perimeter. Um, and then we will find out what is the modified end value sh we should use. And then we're going to put it into Manning's equation and find the flow rate. So let me erase the whiteboard here from the previous calculations. And let's just put some of the uh, preliminary stuff on the whiteboard before you start your own calculations. OK. Um, so what is the angle? The angle is 2 ACOS, or if you've got the Casio, what I'm talking about here is the, uh, the inverse trigonometric fun function uh, cosine to the minus 1. So 2 times A cos of 1 minus 2. And you can see from the screen, now it's y divided by d. So the depth y is 9 inches. The diameter is 24 inches. I don't have to change it to feet since it's a ratio. As long as the units in the numerator and the denominator are the same, then it's, it's a ratio either way. Okay, so that is uh, inside the parentheses here. 
If we do that, it's 0 0.25. 1 minus 2 times 9 over 24. So that's 18 24 1 minus 18 24 is 0.25. So with your calculator, try and do what is a cos of 0.25. And I'll show you here in Excel what it looks like. You know, if you're not confident with your calculator and we're on an exam problem, it would be okay to use Excel just to calculate. Um, if you've got 0.25 on the inside of it, then what we're saying is ACOS of that. So 1.318. It's a bit small, but... So 2 times 1.318 equals 2.636, 2.636 radians. So that's the angle. So if we have just a little sketch here, the water is 9 inches in depth, and it's a 24-inch pipe, then the angle with the center here, theta is 2.6. 36 radians. If it was halfway full, how many radians would it be? Uh, pi, pi radians. 180 degrees is one pi, right? So, I mean, it makes intuitive sense to us. We know that if it's less than half full, it should be less than 3.14 radians. So, I think, uh, you know, the sanity check, we passed the sanity check, so to speak. All right, so we found the angle. Now let's consider what is the area with that angle being known. Okay, so the formula that it says here at the top for the area is uh, area is theta minus sine of theta times d squared divided by a. Isn't that bizarre that you've got the angle minus the sine of the angle and we're just subtracting one from the other? I mean, it's the only instance I'm aware of where you'd do something like that, but it works. So let's substitute in the numbers here. 2.636 minus the sine of 2.636 times 2 feet squared divided by 8. Okay, so that gives us the area is 1.076 square feet. And we do a similar thing with the wetted perimeter. It's going to be d divided by 2 times the angle. So 2 feet divided by 2 times the angle of 2.636 radians. And by the way, radians are kind of a unitless unit. You know, like when we have wetted perimeter, we know that the units of wetted perimeter should be feet. So if you're looking at this and you're saying we've got 2 feet divided by 2 multiplied by 2.636 radians, you may think, well, why isn't the units going to be feet radians? It's not because radians are kind of, they're not really a unit. I don't fully understand that, but that's just the way it is. So 2.636 feet is the wetted perimeter. Okay, so from here, we know the area, we know the wetted perimeter. We have to go to the table and look up what is the modified n value we need to use for the pipe not being all the way full. So we're going to do a similar thing to what we had before, where we're going to our 0.375, which was, remember, right here. And we're going to bounce off of the n figure. So that's this curve and up to the top. So we have 0.375 over to the n value curve, up to the top axis, and I called that 0.1 at uh, 1.27. Okay, so the n value that's going to apply, if this material has a typical n value of 0.013. 0.013 times 1.27. So the n value that we're going to put into Manning's equation 
is 0 0.01651. Okay, so again, I'm going to pause and have you put into, here's Manning's equation right here. Here's Manning's equation. Use this as the end value. Use this as the wetted perimeter. Use this as the area. And the slope is just plain old 0 0.005. And find out what is the Q that you get from that. And when you solved Manning's equation, you got 16.04. That's what came out of the Manning's equation part of it. And then we multiplied it by the Q to Q full ratio of 0.24, and we got 3.85. That was in the first part of the example. Now, just now, you used the actual area, the actual wetted perimeter, and the modified end value, and 3.78. So how does that compare, 3.85 to 3.78? It's actually really close. It doesn't look like it's that close, but it's less than 2% difference. And anytime you're like running your finger up the page and uh, dealing with like a nomograph and manual interpolation from a nomograph, you're going to throw in a little bit of uh, variance there. So I'm pretty happy with how well these two methods agree if we're within 2% there. It just illustrates that. Um, you know, the partially full pipe hydraulics can be handled either by the uh, flow rate nomograph or by finding the angle, the actual area, actual wetted perimeter, and then finding the modified end value. So concept review. Why is there a modified end value? Anybody? feel like if we had a short answer on the final exam, would you be able to answer why there is a different end value when the pipe is only partly full? Okay, good. Yeah, exactly right. So it's all about what is the ratio of flow area to the wetted perimeter? So here, we've got nine inches of depth and quite a lot of wetted perimeter relative to how much cross-sectional area there is. There's like a bigger reduction in flow area when you reduce the depth than there is a reduction in wetted perimeter. Um, and another way to, to like supplement that thinking is just think about like in a pipe, what part of the flow is furthest away from the influence of where the shear stress is applied by the pipe? Like the resistance is at the pipe. And what's like the most, mm, the most beneficial flow area is the sections that's far away from the pipe. And so it's like that center section of the pipe that is able to really accommodate a lot of flow without much interference from where the shear stress is being applied by the concrete. And you know, like when it's only partly full, most of the flow area is close to the wetted perimeter. So that's why we have to have a modified end value. It's just the effect of friction is bigger when you have partly full pipes than when you've got all the way full. Now, how come nobody asked me about this yet? Some semesters, people ask me about that. So would somebody please ask me about that? What's up with that? Yeah, what's up with that? What is it implying? Why, first of all, maybe you don't even see what's strange about it yet. Follow it down. OK, 1.0. It's to the right of 1.0. So what is that saying about the flow capacity of a pipe that's like 95% full? Interpret that. Olivia, interpret that. If it's 95% full, what's the flow capacity compared to all, if it's all the way full? Basically the same. Basically the same, but, but actually more. So this is saying, actually, a pipe that's not all the way full can carry more water than a pipe that is all the way full. That's what this is saying, because 
Here's 1.0. So here's the pipe. If it's 100% full, it can carry, from our just example that we just did, it'll carry 16 cubic feet per second if it's all the way full. But if it's 95% full, it'll actually carry more than that. Anybody understand why? Let me just do a little sketch on the whiteboard here, and maybe that'll give you the clue. Why would a pipe have more flow capacity if it wasn't all the way full compared to if it is all the way? So here's our pipe. And here's what it looks like if it's most of the way full. So, so what about the little bit at the top? So we've reduced the wetted perimeter by a fair amount. And how much have we reduced our cross-sectional area? By a little, yeah. So the pipe actually, like when it's 95% full, more water can flow through there because when it gets just that little bit higher, now it's touching the top. So you've got just an infinitesimal increase in the flow area, but a significant increase in the wetted perimeter. So that's what this little boost above the 1.0 line is all about. So I think that's kind of interesting. OK, any questions before we move on? Yes? For the uh, beginning of the example, whenever we type in 3.14159. Yeah. Um, is it, are we going to get a different answer if we just put the pi symbol in the calculator? Or do you want us to? Well, I think if, if you're writing 3 for pi, I'd take off points for that. If you write 3.14, I'll wish you wrote more, but I won't take off points. If you read 3.14159, I'll say, yeah, they love life. That's, that's good. <laughs> this is a good person. They've got like spirit in their soul, you know? And pi will get you basically the same number as that. So, I mean, I won't see any difference if you use the pi symbol then. Like, this is what I usually just type that in. Yeah, we'll get the same thing. Can you go any further? How, how many digits do you have? Uh, no, uh, I, that's all I have memorized. <laughs> how many do you have memorized? I don't know. Uh, Beyond that? Nine. What's after nine? I don't know. Yeah. One seven. Uh, one seven? Yeah. Maybe that'll be a test question. That'd be a good one, right? <laughs> Pi to 10 digits? You tell us right now, I'm on board with it. You know, there's a history professor that makes people memorize every country in the world. And you have to be able to locate it on a map. So I mean, there's like 100 countries. No, there's more than 100. 200, 200 something. So I think, I think it would be reasonable for me to institute a 10-digit pi requirement. But maybe next semester. I'll put that in next semester syllabus. OK, I talked about hydrogen sulfide a little bit already. Um, Hydrogen sulfide is a gas that forms when there's not enough oxygen in the water. Um, there are bacteria that want to break down the uh, waste constituents in wastewater. How many of you are in uh, 351 this semester or have taken it before? Okay, so you guys know what BOD is, right? Biochemical oxygen demand. It's a pollutant just in the sense that this wastewater, when it's discharged to a stream, um, there is organic material in the wastewater that needs to be broken down, and the bacteria that break it down will also consume oxygen at the same time that they're breaking down that organic substrate. It's their food. The bugs eat food, they consume oxygen, and we don't like it when they cause the oxygen to dip. So hydrogen sulfide forms when Water is moving slowly and the sewage doesn't mix, then that can be one reason that hydrogen sulfide forms. Or it can be if the strength of the waste is very high, that increases the risk of hydrogen sulfide formation. And uh, there is an empirical formula that's used to estimate the risk of formation of hydrogen sulfide. It's this Z hydrogen sulfide potential parameter. So what you do is put in the effective biochemical oxygen demand, which is a temperature corrected concentration of BOD. So like if you've got a wastewater that is 200 milligrams per liter of BOD, and that's the biochemical oxygen demand at 20 degrees Celsius, 
If your wastewater was even warmer, then that would increase the biochemical oxygen demand because it's going to make the, uh, the bugs that break down that food even more active. So you can see in this formula, any temperature above 20 degrees Celsius is going to increase the EBOD, and any temperature below 20 degrees Celsius is going to reduce the activity of the microorganisms and would reduce your effective BOD. So that's one of the parameters in here. B is the top width of the water in the pipe. So we're talking about water flowing through like a pipe that's partly full. So here's B and uh, the wetted perimeter, of course. We've talked a lot about wetted perimeter today already. Uh, slope of the channel, flow rate. So you can see the parameters that go into calculating this Z term. And if you've got a Z that is below 5,000, then it would be unlikely for hydrogen sulfide to form. There's kind of an uncertainty zone between 5 and 10,000. And then above 10,000, it's likely that it's going to be forming. And so we don't have a lot of control over the strength of the waste. That's not something a hydraulic designer can affect. But we can see how our pipe diameter may be affecting things. And occasionally, we can shape the flow rates if we try and reduce infiltration and inflow, or if you know low flush toilets and uh, shower head restrictions, that kind of thing. You can try and nudge flow rates in one way or the other. And slope is also a parameter that we could have some mild control over the slope. Like when you're laying out a sewer, if you've got a flat area, the sewers are going downhill. So eventually, they're going to get deep enough where you can't have it infinitely deep. You have to have some sort of a tank with a pump that lifts it up, and then you start going downhill again. So the slope of the pipe, you can affect how steep it is. And if you find you're getting too much hydrogen sulfide, um, you could increase the slope. And that just means you'd have to have these pumping stations, lift stations, more often. So let's just work a quick example. This is similar to the homework problem, the second homework problem you've got due on Friday. And based on the limited time available, I think what I'm going to do is just walk you through the solution on this, just show you. Because I don't think we have time to actually put it into the calculator ourselves. Uh, this is closely related to what we've just done with the partly full pipe hydraulics. So here we've got a 750 millimeter diameter concrete pipe. It has to carry a flow of 0.92 cubic meters per second of wastewater at 30 degrees Celsius. So we know the temperature that we're going to calculate the EBOD. From here it says the BOD is 350 milligrams per liter. So we just want to know What's the, uh, the hydraulic parameters here? And then what's the probability of hydrogen sulfide formation? So here's the step-by-step -step on what we do with something like this. Uh, that's not it. Nor is it this. OK. So we haven't used this Manning's equation yet to find the, uh, the angle. If we know the flow rate that's going through the pipe, the Q is known, and we want to find out what is the angle here, then I put that into the solver with like the, the known flow rate, the known diameter, the known slope. And this is 4.23 radians. And so that's more than half full. And so from the angle being solved, now we get the wetted perimeter, the top width, B. Uppercase B means the, the, the length of that top width in the open channel pipe. And then the depth of flow, H, can be estimated from knowing the angle. So we've got all those parameters that we're going to put into the, uh, the Z potential formu uh, formula. But we have to calculate the effective BOD since this is pretty warm water. 33 degrees Celsius, then what was just a, a five-day 20 degree BOD of 350 milligrams per liter jumps all the way up to 843. So this is someplace warm, you know, like a desert environment. Maybe this is Arizona. They've got warm wastewater in this instance. So high BOD 
And uh, putting it into the formula for the uh, Z potential, which was here, EBOD, wetted perimeter in the numerator, slope to the one half, Q to the one third, uh, top width, all that's in the denominator. So uh, you can see that it would be 7373 is the Z potential. And that was in that middle uncertain range. So hydrogen sulfide might form in a case like that. And this is at a specific flow rate. That's at the flow rate that was um, 0.92 cubic meters per second. So what you'd need to ask yourself is, is this like an average daily flow rate? Because average daily flow rates don't have a lot of significance when it comes to wastewater. Um, because sometimes it's going to be a lot higher, sometimes it's going to be a lot lower. So maybe what we'd want to do is we'd want to analyze what is the Z potential um, during the maximum daily flow and what's the Z potential at the minimum daily flow. So it could be that overnight there are several hours where hydrogen sulfide is forming and uh, not only is it smell bad and not only is it poisonous, but it's also corrosive. So like the steel steps in a manhole could be, uh, could be falling apart. It basically forms sulfuric acid inside of the, uh, because it condenses and forms with the humidity in the, in the sewer and uh, it turns from hydrogen sulfide into sulfuric acid and it really accelerates the corrosion of reinforcing bar. So the steps on a manhole would be a place that you'd maybe see is threatened from hydrogen sulfide formation, or maybe even just the, uh, the manhole cover itself. Um, and you know, over the long term, the cement in the pipe could be pitted and corroded by low pH. So this is potentially risky. This would be uh, maybe indicating some additional assessment and uh, mitigation measures may be needed. All right. That's all the time we've got for today. It's 11.49. I'll let you go one minute early because I'm such a great guy. So I'll see you on Friday. Remember to install um, Hecras for Friday.